Welcome to 3, a part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy getting together as we go into the quarterfinal of Monte Carlo. Novak Djokovic coming off of a win over Lorenzo Musetti. We're going to get into that. We're going to go back to everything that went down from the split of Goran Ivanisevic to uh, the, the withdrawal from Miami, looking ahead to clay court season and the rest of Monte Carlo as well. Uh, but let's start with uh, what we what we witnessed this morning just off the top, and it's the, the win over Musetti. Same round, same opponent as last year's defeat at the hands of the Italian. And, uh, you know, Musetti has always played Djokovic tough. Joel, what did you make of Novak's performance in that one? Wow, he was serving 1-3 at out, point to go down two breaks, gets out of it. Uh, again, Musetti serving 4-3-40 love, misses a quite makeable forehand and ends up losing that game. Um, I think Novak kind of fought through it. You know, he fought through it. Musetti is kind of, he's a the classic dangerous opponent. You know, one-handed backhand down the line. One of his, one of his signature shots. And uh, it's a good effort from Novak, but you know, obviously, he's obviously, like we like to say, scratching for form. Yeah, I agree. I, I thought he, level-wise, he played all right, you know, fine. In the big moments, he was way more reliable. And, you know, Musetti, there, there were mental cracks. Like, he missed a forehand up 40 love in that first set to go up 5-3. That was a really, really easy forehand. And it just went off the rails the rest of that game. Terrible mistakes gives Djokovic the break back. Uh, and then there were just a couple moments, you know, 30 all, second serve return, miss. And like, those are the kind of things that were happening with Musetti. And Djokovic, the the best, one of the best things about his performance is uh, he was solid uh, on big points, which goes such a long way. Also, uh, what did you make of the court position difference, Joel? I, I felt Novak was pretty suffocating uh, with, with the way he was returning second serves, which was pretty weak. You know, Musetti's second serve was kind of sitting there and uh, was actually able to like rush Lorenzo, even though it's a slower surface Monte Carlo. I thought that he was really kind of getting up inside the baseline and not giving Musetti a lot of time to operate and kind of forcing him uh, to attack or get hurt because any ball that was dropping short, Novak was like right on top of it because he was taking so much time away. Well, that's a good way to play Musetti because you want to hit him before he hits you and he likes to set up and he's got the the long, the long take back. You know, he, he needs a lot of time and space to set up that one-hander. And Novak, it's interesting. It's so interesting the things we've learned about the over the decades about the two-hander, how compact it can be and how much you can take time and space away with it in a way that was once not thought because, and it exposed, you know, you kind of expose this. I mean, Musetti has some limitations though. He's so, he's so fun to watch when he's playing well, but you almost see him as kind of a, a foil like player for Novak. I mean, they've had many good matches. He's beaten Novak. He was leading Novak one year, two sets to love at Roland Garros. Mm -hmm. So Novak, is, you, you can only imagine the, the thickness of the scouting report Novak has on Musetti. <laughs> yeah, and Novak I, I... Is, is incredibly good at noticing when an, his opponent is self-destructing or not self-destructing, but um, beating himself. And sometimes even to the fan's eye or the viewer's eye, they don't even realize what's happening. Because like you said, Gil, a missed return here, um, you know, a, a makeable forehand there and some short, shorter points on, on a surface that is not as prone to shorter points. And before you know it, one guy is just not beating himself and then the other guy is. Yeah, uh, particularly in when nerves come into play. Um, I, I wonder also though, in terms of the scouting report, if it is, look, we really need to strip him of time and take the ball as early as possible when going at that back end because it is so long. Bigger picture, Amy, the expectations coming into Monte Carlo, not that high for Novak given the, the withdrawal in Miami, the reasons cited for the withdrawal in Miami, the recent history in Monte Carlo and his tendency to kind of build up as the clay court season goes on. Uh, the, the first round victory uh, by, by Novak was commanding. He beats Musetti, who's this is his probably his best tournament, his best surface, no doubt. 
so in that respect, I think that Djokovic has been a lot better than maybe it would have been reasonably expected. Yeah, and he has a home there. I think you said both his kids were born there. There's a lot of family and friends around, so there's a lot of other commitments. Not that he's ever kind of let that get in the way in the past because he has one here, but um, you wouldn't expect him to win the tournament necessarily, or you might not have picked it just given everything that you said. But, you know, as I wrote last week, he is one of the greatest clay court players of all time. So you do bear that in mind. And um, he knows what he's doing out there. So I like the attitude, though. His attitude right now chose not to play Miami. You know, that's his business. That's his right, especially at 36 years old. Um, Going to warm up with Monte Carlo? Yeah. Um, Going to do what he does? Going to play the way he does? Get down a break? I just like the, um, the attitude that, like I'm the goat kind of without saying it, but, um, and I'm going to do what I do. And, and the rest of you can just watch. And Monte Carlo kind of the, uh, in American baseball terms, the spring training of the clay court season, you know, it's like a, the early part, you know, I'm, I know Nadal won it several times and I forget if the years Novak won Roland Garros, how he did at Monte Carlo, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like a no lose quality Monte Carlo. 20, 2014 and 2016, I believe, were Novak's Monte Carlo titles. So he won. That was the year he ended up winning the French in 16. Yep. Right. So, so, uh, but it's kind of like a no lose. It's kind of like a, uh, in golf terms, it's like a mulligan. You win it, you're good. If you don't, this is okay. Early days. We get a lot of clay ahead of us. It was a, it was a pretty headstrong decision to pull out of Miami. And also, not make up an injury excuse, not say sick, struggling with some, my, I don't know, my shoulder hurts. Just like, nope, family, I'd rather not, uh, not my priority right now. Uh, it, is that kind of what you were referring to there, Amy? Like he's doing yeah. what he wants? And two days later, I'm going to run down to the beach in Miami. Hey, I'm still here. Tournament's going on. I ain't playing, but I'm going to go for a little jog on the beach. Yeah, I like it. Look, he deserves it, man. Like the career he's had, the things that he's done, um, he can play whatever he wants to play at this point. And he might well have had an injury, though. He just wouldn't want to say it. Mm. But but why would he say? Why would he say? I've never in my, I, maybe you've seen this before. I've never seen someone pull out a tournament of a tournament and say, I, "I, it's time, really. I want to prioritize my time with family," and then Goran said the same thing in his interview with Sasha Osmo that Novak's focus at the time, even leading up to Indian Wells was not quite as what it would normally be, not quite as tennis heavy and more off court focused. I like the answer that Novak gave to Prakash. I think it was yesterday after his first round win where Prakash said, just kind of point blank, what's more important to you this year, Roland Garros or the Olympics? And Novak, very, in very short order, came out and said the Olympics. I mean, he's just like doing what he wants to do, answering the question directly, saying what he feels. Um, I'm there for it. I like this. Let me correct the record. I said 14 and 16. It's 13 and 15. Oh, so okay. Okay, so okay. he did, he did not um, win go on to win yeah, that year, but he won Monaco. Okay, good. Time. Neither here nor there. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, the 13, 2013 was so close. That was the epic five setter against Nadal in the semis. Probably would have beaten Ferrer in that final. Uh, and then 15 was the loss to Vavrinka in the Roland Garros final. Maybe his two biggest what if. Roland Garros years, right? <laughs> I doubt there's any correlation. Like if he wins this year, don't panic, folks. No, well, no, I think I think that's the thing, and that goes back to Joel Spring training. It it's always been, at least in recent years, the cardio at Monte Carlo is not there yet, and Clay long rally, long rally, long rally. He just hasn't been able to do it at Monte Carlo, and then he starts to 
get into better and better shape. And, uh, you know, even sometimes when he's trying to build up his forehand for the clay this time of year, not quite, not quite there at Monte Carlo. And then by Rome, he's playing the kind of tennis that he needs to play in order to win Roland Garros. So it's been that slow build uh, every time. Um, and, and this is probably maybe up there for the best that he's looked at Monte Carlo in the last several years. But I didn't expect that given the fact that he, you know, felt, I think for motivational reasons, did not want to play Miami. So I just think it's a good sign for Novak, mm-hmm. ultimately. It's but Joel, I don't think are are you not con- you're not convinced that the reason he pulled out of Miami was because of motivation, or you or you are going with that? I don't know. I just think I just have seen you know you see statements and actions. Yeah, he just he didn't want to play it, and he came up with the best way to say he didn't want to play it. And I'm not trying to say, oh no, he's hiding an injury. I just think he. It, it's kind of like the way it's kind of like reminds me when people say, and well, you know, a lot of the game is mental. All errors are mental. I just didn't send the, you know, it's like, yeah, it's all mental. What else is it? I mean, so it's, it's kind of like he, he did, he, he didn't want to play the tournament and he said in the best way possible for him why he didn't want to play it. And of course we have no idea what's going on with his body, mind, family, the stuff with Goran, you know, that's the whole thing with tennis. That's so hard to get at is what these other things, that becomes kind of uh, you know, political science. Fair enough. Alex Dimonor is next in Monte Carlo. We'll we'll hit that at the end of the show, but let's go to Goran now. After the Sinner loss at the Australian Open, after the Luca Nardi loss um, at, at Indian Wells, um, it was it was clear that something was a little bit off. Obviously, he didn't look close to himself in any of those particular losses, but it's always a shock, no matter what. Even if you know five years is a long time and it was a very successful partnership, um, it's always a shock to see something that works so well in even Isovich Djokovic because it was remarkable the kind the work that they did together over that five years uh, to see that come to an end. There's there's never really there's never preparing for that. Just like we were shocked when it went from Vida even Isovich combo package to just even Isovich himself. Um, so, you know, Amy, what was your level of, of surprise given what we had seen on court, but also knowing what we saw uh, or knowing what we know about the long-term successful uh, nature of their partnership? All due respect to Goran, I was actually surprised it hadn't happened sooner, only because Novak is known to tinker and change things up. And, you know, I... I think I remarked to somebody who, who a, a fan maybe on social media who said Goran and, and Djokovic have been together for a long time and I, I might have said something like well just wait you know and then two weeks later it happened um, it, it's the great testament to Novak is that he remains on really good terms with all these people Boris Becker you know even people that he had short-lived stints with like Agassi and Stepanek Um, but he does make changes. And, uh, so now we have a new coach. You know, I think sometimes with this coaching thing in tennis, these coaches have like a, uh, two year first renewal maximum. It's almost like two years into it. The, the, the protocol should be the player and coach ought to take this kind of like macro offset and figure out what they're really, what's, what it's about now why they're even working together after two years and what they bring. I mean, cause I think I, I've, I mean, it's funny. I've been, I've been with a few juniors lately and talking with their parents about instructors and coaches, just the whole, the whole dynamic around this, I find very um, distinct and sometimes strange right up to the pro level, you know, mm-hmm. like, what, like it reminds me of like when, when Federer was working with Edberg and why that was different than Anna Cohn and what those, what those mean, what those mean to the particular player and how little we know or what we think we know or why it happens. Remember the player grows up with coaches as employees. The whole time you're playing tennis, the coaches you're served, you're paying for him. Different yeah. than just any other sport. Yeah, it, it's certainly different. And there's, 
definitely a lack of information and a lot of bad assumptions that are sometimes made by fans and sometimes even media when observing player coach stuff. Um, and for example, you know, before Goran gave that interview, the the reason for the split really wasn't known. Um, not that everything needs such a reason, um, especially when you, you work with someone for five years. Um, it's a it's a really long time. It's not if you work f- with someone for two months and then there's a split, something happened. There's a disagreement. You know, clearly something happened. But after five years. It doesn't have to be something happened. It might just be time. Like nonetheless, and that's basically Goran basically said, look, there was there was fatigue. He was tired of me. I was tired of him. <laughs> that that's what was said. Um and it's like these things have an expiration date sometimes. What people were kind of looking at, or some people, and Goran spent a lot of time trying to dispel this uh in his interview was like People wanted to say, well, because of all the tense exchanges that Novak had with Goran on court, that was a signal that their relationship was fractured. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's, that, that's, that, was, that was written a lot. Well, this, that's right. And that's why, that's where it gets in this whole realm. It's kind of like the thing with Novak pulling out a tournament. You get into this kind of like, you know, what observational commentary who knows what the nature of their interactions is away from cameras, how they connect with each other, how they talk with each other. And then, of course, now there's this, uh, in the last couple of years, the legal legalized mid-match coaching. And what's mm-hmm. going on with that? Are, are they happy? Are they, are they um, you know, are they getting on? What's going mm-hmm. on? Oh, he glared at him. He glared at him after the break point. I mean, he's like, God. <laughs> I I think every like dynamic um, between a player and a coach and and even when that coach changes is unique. And I think of Tiafo, who had, you know, a coach that he was really close to for a few years and they were close in age and then he wasn't getting to where he wanted. So bittersweet you know parted ways with him and then went to Wayne Ferreira and the first thing Ferreira said is start running go for a run and you're not allowed to use your your headphones or listen to music you just or you bring your phone you just have to go for a run like he told him what to do and that is something that maybe the previous coach would not have done Mm -hmm. so like every dynamic is just a little bit different and as Joel interestingly points out now you have this new thing thrown into the mix, which is in-match coaching, legalized. And so that's a thing, and everybody's watching. Um, I, I will tell you, just as an aside, what I was shocked at was that Novak parted ways with his longtime agent. Um, and this I, was, and I think this it, was last year. Yes, yes. Um, that was a shock um, when that happened. It... it he Eduardo was with Novak for years and years and years and years. So he had kind of outlasted many, many uh, regimes. But I think it just goes back to what I said in the beginning, which is he's a tinkerer, both with his technique and with his off the court stuff and his recovery and, you know, with his team around him. There's not a lot of time also. Like it's clock is ticking, couple years left, you would think. So if if stuff went flat or started to get stale, and it seems like motivationally, at least in March, it did. That might maybe maybe there's nothing Goran could have done about that. Uh, but I, there's a sense of urgency, I think, this year. Olympics, you know what I mean? Um. Oh, here we go. I mean, I think uh, urgency. It, it's 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 yes and no. I mean, the guy won three majors last year. There's another sense. There could be another sense of kind of like, let's enjoy that. Let's enjoy the ride. Let's try a few more little experiments. Yeah, but I mean, doesn't ma- that? That's why. That's why people were surprised. That's why it felt like a very quick, out of nowhere decision. Because last year was so good. Tennis. I like what Amy talked about about the the tinkering, and maybe Novak thought, yeah, this is the, the maybe Novak thought, hey, look, let me just. I don't want to just ride in with the with the old team right to the end. I want to 
try something to the end that's a little different. The manager, his work is done. He got me all my, he's got, he's done his work. He's got my deals. Let me, let me see what else someone else might bring to me. New is exciting. Yeah, new is exciting. But I, but urgency, that's 37, 30, he's going to be 37. He won a zillion titles. It's all good. Enjoy it. It's all gravy. Once, once you feel like it's all good, I think you're done winning. Oh, no, no, it's not done winning. I mean, I, I don't know, really. Did, but really? I don't think that can be the mentality. I don't think all good. I think all good is a death sentence. That's when you stop winning. I think, I think urgency <laughs> gravy is, is a death sentence. <laughs> I, I think I think urgency is a sentence. I think urgency is a not thing. It kind of gets to our whole. It, this is like a, a continuation of our prior dialogue about terms and ending. And 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 maybe looking how we're looking at the Paris, the lenses we look at the periscope through urgency. You can create urgency around anything, or you can create urgency around nothing. And whether it's urgency or complacency, right? That's kind of what we're. That's kind of the implication of it's of it's all good. It was always good for Federer. He knew he was Roger Federer. You know the whole thing about oh, like I always like it again when I hear the phrase oh, you've got nothing more to prove. What did I have to prove to anyone anyway? What does anyone have to prove? You know. So again, I just think this whole, I think we're, I think we're onto an interesting dialogue with Novak and Rafa about late stage career. You know, I'm not, I'm not stupid enough to think, oh, it's all good. It's, they're right in the middle. They got, we all know it's closer to midnight for these guys than it is to dawn. But I don't know. Got a but lot we're of- in the, We're in the now. We're, we're, we're in the now. We're, yeah. we're Frank Alex Dimonoff. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think the constructs that we're talking about, is it better to create urgency or is it better to have complacency? It's all gravy. It's kind of a, an artificial construct that the three of us are kind of forming. I mean, it's fun to talk about, but Novak is in such rare air. There's nobody like him and there's nobody who's done what he's done. So whatever he sets up with his, himself in terms of motivation will be kind of uncharted territory. So therefore, maybe we just kind of observe and not try to figure it out too much. You know, I think urgency, I'm, I was reeling through my head while we've been chatting about late stages of certain players and how they managed it. And Pete Sampras hadn't won a title for a couple of years and he had, he created a little bit more of the desire to compete well. I mean, other players... I don't know. I think Martina Navratilova. Yeah, the, the the urgency. Look, competition creates urgency. I get it in the moment. I get that. But I mean, the the management of one's time and career. I do what I do. I like winning tennis matches. I like playing tennis matches. What will be will be. Yeah. Um. I think it feels different when it's your last Olympics. This is it. Well, the Olympics, the Olympics is an interesting thing. You're right. And Novak, well, I don't think in his, res like, for example, if Novak doesn't win the Olympics, it'll mean zero on his evaluate legacy evaluation. However, his affinity with Serbia and his desire to excel there, and he's had some frustrating moments there. I get that. Mm -hmm. I get that. Maybe that's what this is. Up. Maybe that's what this really is. I don't know. I mean, players have a way of, you know, articulating their own priorities. Right. He's won all these other ones multiple times. It's interesting that he chose a Serbian coach now le leading into the Olympics. There may be something with that, you know, surround himself with his fellow countrymen. Well, that, that also plays into something that Andy Roddick said, and, and I agreed with in the moment when, you know, when the, when the Goran split first happened and one of the questions that was being asked is who's next, as if this is like, Back to Joel, you'll appreciate this. As if this is like the NHL or the NFL and, and it's like, Chip Kelly's a free agent. You know, like <laughs> it's not, there's too big a pool in tennis to even wrap your head around. Like I predict it's going to be this person. But I think what, what was expected is that Novak is going to go to familiarity, someone who he knows. And again, I, I think what stage of his career he is in comes into play here. You're 36. This isn't time to experiment. This isn't time to uh, go out into the free market and forge new relationships with people who you don't know or trust. You've been around the block. You know a lot of people in this game. It's very important, you know, especially because this happened in March. You have to have something 
that you're comfortable with quickly. Roland Garros, Wimbledon, Olympics, U.S. Open. It's gonna it's gonna come at you fast. So this isn't time. This isn't time to potentially bring in something that you are unfamiliar with. Nenad Zimanich is someone who he's known for 15, 20 years. He knows exactly what he's getting. And I think that's a big thing. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. I liked the point you made, Amy, about the Serbian connection and maybe the Olympics. And uh, that could be kind of interesting. Yeah. Of course, in tennis, uh, when do players hire someone who they've never met? I mean, sports it happens. Hire, it sports happens. Hire, um, sports teams hire coaches who their players haven't met, maybe, right? Like this guy had been coaching college and now he's going to coach the NFL team. But I'm thinking about in tennis, not that they know that they have to know that well. I mean, it's such a such a personal sport. You know, you're, they're even sharing, they're sharing practice courts. Do you know what I mean? They're they're adjacent. They're practicing with the other team. There, there's a lot of a lot of contacts. So I'm thinking, who who would Novak not know? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I know that when players do like a search, you know, in the interview process, they they talk to some people who at, at sometimes they talk to some people who they don't actually know, but they know of w their work and what they've done and their resume. Usually there's some sort of a connection. This person I I know, I know. It's just interesting thing, but I think you're you had a great point. You're right. At this point, Novak wants something. Familiar. Like, here's a question: Did Yannick Sinner know Darren Cahill? Did he know him? I knew more of him. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And and to your point, like Murray hiring Moresmo, that was highly experimental and different, and and like new and let's give this a spin now's maybe not the time to do that something like that for novak um so he went with familiarity and comfort yeah um in terms of the rest of clay season and the rest of monte carlo i do want to hit the demon or match specifically in a, in a second but like at what point do the alarm bells kind of quiet down in terms of what he looked like against nardi and the uncharacteristic performance against Sinner, uh, giving giving the start of twenty twenty four this this hint this twinge of like oh no like is have we kind of reached a, a point where where Djokovic is 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 he not going to contend for all the biggest titles for the rest of the year and 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 win several of them is is that not the year the kind of year he's going to have? At what point do you think we'll? know and understand what the answer to that question is. And I'll, I'll say what, what I said after he lost to Nardi was talk to me after Roland Garros. That, that's what I said. Well, Do we like that? I'll say, I'll say if he wins a title prior to Roland Garros, I think that's a good indicator. If he reaches a final and the guy beats him in a zoning effort, you know, the guy who beats him in the final plays a tremendous match. I think that's still, okay, you're in there, Novak. If he doesn't do that, then I can, then I see your, okay, let's see what happens to Roland Garros. But we'll see. Even if he did not win Roland Garros or contend or, or what have you, um, I'm still like, quote unquote, not worried that we're on the, downward trajectory never to come back up again both the losses that you mentioned gil the one to sinner and the one to nardi are kind of i hate to say this kind of throwaways for me like cares kind of thing um because there are legitimate reasons why he didn't maybe perform up to peak so um i don't know wake me when I don't know if you ever need to wake me. To sure, be I mean, look at, at at some point it'll happen, right? Like at yeah. some at, at some point. So, uh, are people way too quick to yes. to say oh, yeah. it's now? Oh, no, a hundred percent. And we've seen that time and time again. We've seen it time and time again. This is the sport. I think the sport lends itself to it because it's individual. So it's always lent itself to it. But I think I think the last oh I don't know ten years have made it even more it's like a power upgrade have made it even more so everything from the decline of certain mainstream media to the lack to the um 
access than there's like social media lots it, yeah we're in a we're in a it's not just a hot take it's a quick take it's a fast take it's a now take and it's see i told you i told you he's never you know kind of a highly outcome based predictive yes yes yeah so uh, amy you feel like the two losses can be explained uh, in in simple terms we won't break it down fully but is it for you does it kind of go like the illness stuff and the excellence of center in australia and the fact that it was the start of March and Novak just wasn't all that motivated and focused when it comes to Nardi? Uh, the Australian Open, it's kind of like Sinner emerging as, as a major elite, plus been there, done that. What do I have to prove here? And he may not even like cognizantly realize that or it may not be in his conscience, but um, conscious, I should say, but, um, the, the loss to Nardi, like, what do I got to prove? You know, like it, it would be normal not to be motivated to in that situation. So I can explain it. And also I just don't care that much. I mean, I care obviously, but you know, I will, I will start to dial in now leading up to Roland Garros and watch and see what's going on. Well, so Australia, I was okay. Also looking at just the outlierness of it. Cause it was the first bad performance in, at a major in uh, like about five years. So you know, it, it's going to happen, right? It's just going to happen. The, and then, you know, Indian Wells as, uh, as bad as the level was first set was as bad as I've ever seen him play maybe um, against Nardi. Uh, it was again, it was like, okay, it's, you know, he hasn't done well at Indian Wells in since 2016. Like it's been forever. He doesn't play well this time of year generally. So it was like, okay, you know what you can freak out about it, or you can just be like, yep, this has been normal. And then he wins three majors. Like this is just what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, that's why I also feel like, okay, clay court season, we're going to have a better idea when this clay swing is over about where he's actually at and what kind of year this is. Because again, at some point it will happen. Like there's going to be a decline in results. Yeah. Now we have a good long buildup to the long major. It's funny how each of these majors has a buildup. that's almost fitting with how it's played. You know, I figured, of course, the clay, the buildup for Roland Garros would be the longest and grass kind of quick and, and it's sort of in the middle Goldilocks with the with the two pretty much two hardcore events that mm -hmm. the top players play. And uh yeah, I think the early part of the year, you know, remember Novak, for all we know, Sinner, is this his 2008, the way it was for Novak when Novak first won the Australian 16 years ago? Or might be, or was it even 2011 when Novak won his second major and ended up having his first tremendous year and pretty much became I, the guy. And I Sinner, gotta think it's 2011. For Sinner? Uh, he's he's playing stratospheric well, like, oh, level. His colleague of mine said, talk to me after Roland Garros. You know, we'll I mean, if Sinner goes on, let's see what happens. I mean, yeah, he's- He's stratospheric, but Alcaraz beat him. I know, it, but it, it, it's in, not, in, you know, he's not untouchable. No, he he can, he might, he's lost two matches in the last- uh, Six, six months Six or months, I mean- <laughs> Oh, no. Remember Sinner. this? This we were talking this way about Alcaraz a year ago or so. Well, yes. Know? After after Wimbledon last year, Alcaraz had hadn't lost much over the season. It was it was like he had won, I think five titles in eight events or something like that. Right, he was hot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Hot. That's a good word. Hot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, people get on streaks, you know. They do, they do, but still, this is. I gotta. I I'll say this is Sinner's 2011. I I don't think it's a 2000. Okay, all right, we'll hold you to that. Well, hold me to that. Hold me all to right. that. That means you're opining that Sinner's going to win two more majors this year. Uh, no, I wouldn't. wouldn't <laughs> go that far. I do think. I think he could. I think he could. Oh yeah, but, you're totally. I can, I, no one's got. No one would disagree with you on that. It's just. I think. I think Novak is still kind of in waiting and i think the the year the year round nature of the sport the world of social media again makes the um 
the, the, the new cycle, I don't, I don't even call it a cycle anymore. I don't even know what to call it. You know what I mean? It's like, there aren't even cycles. It just goes and yeah. things happen and guys win and there's dialogue and stuff. You know? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of freaking out all the time. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, no doubt. Well, okay. Alex D. Menor has also been on a excellent run of form um, that has been good enough to get him inside the top 10. And, you know, we like to talk like Djokovic has only lost two matches this year. He's actually lost three. He lost to Demon or at United Cup to start the year. I, I barely remember it. I, I watched it even. And it's just like it didn't hit as hard as the next two losses, probably because Novak was, uh, well, you know, it was pre-Australian Open. And there is nothing about the way Djokovic played that made anyone um, too worried. Um but Demonor has been tough as nails, not very good on clay usually. Right. But I, I actually think he is going to be an interesting test for Djokovic because he's going to lengthen rallies and test the lungs and the legs. Spot on. A lot of balls, a lot of rallies. Demonor a little more um, old school in his racket head speed work. So it's not like he's a guy who generates this terminal power on clay. That's why he's better on harder surfaces, but God, I, I, I like him. You know, he's a, he gives you an honest day's work for an honest day's wage. And, and it's, it'll be different than the kind of shot making of Musetti, you know, which is kind of like, Whoa, this guy can't miss. And now this guy, okay. Try to get Musetti off, weather the storm. That's when you play with, with, uh, with, uh, demon or it's a, with Alex is a different, a different, I'm not quite sure what the, what the motto is with him, you know? Grind it through. Demonar is a dynamic player, both literally and metaphorically. His game changes more than than you realize, especially in terms of how much he's going for his shots and his power. And he had an interview, I don't know, a couple months ago where he was talking about how his girlfriend actually had an impact on him, uh, Katie Bolter, because she's a power player. And he was watching her practice and basically realizing that maybe he should try to up his power a little bit. And I've seen him do that. So um, incredible player, absolutely incredible player. And you just don't know what you're going to get on any given day within, you know, the style that he plays. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Amy. I, I think he's become one of the best chameleons in tennis. Yeah. He he identifies what needs to be done and he'll do it. And I have a feeling, especially on slow clay, where even if he tries to be a power player, I don't know if he quite has enough muscle to execute that well. But I mean, I, I bet he's well aware of Djokovic's recent history in Monte Carlo and you know the the context and, and also Musetti got things physical at, at one point in the second set. And there was a change of ends where Novak was looking actually pretty pretty shaky um, in terms of how fatigued he was feeling. And there was like shaking in the, in the hand a little bit, which we had seen uh, once last year. I, I think the game plan is going to be like, let's make this hurt a whole lot. For Alex? Yeah, I, I, yeah like let's, let's, let's keep mm -hmm. these points long and physical. And let's see, let's try to just make Novak feel it in the lungs and in the legs. I, I really think that's going to be the plan. That's interesting. I wonder, though, then Novak and so, no, and just, you know, there's not just not miss, like channel his inner Carino Busta and just kind of go to work. Just be like, yeah, I think I think Alex will come into the match and be like, yeah, my cardio is better than you than, than yours. And that's where we're going to find an edge. I, nobody wants to see Alex in the draw, like, because even if you can get through the match, um, you might be hampered in the next round. So that's a really good point. And I, that's a great strategy, at, especially given where Novak is at this particular point in time. So it'll be a fun match to watch. So that's interesting, though. So that's kind of the opposite of the lesson Alex said he learned from his girlfriend. Right. Right. But as Gil pointed out, this is clay. But I mean, the the point, the greater point on Demonar was that he's a chameleon. So he may go back to what he was doing before. Who knows? Yeah, that's interesting. I think I love that chameleon. I love that chameleon analogy. And he's uh, he's an interesting player because it's there's a you know oh you know who Batista Gu. That's the more 
relevant one, the Eastern grip, flatter ball. And yet, yeah, there's a way I, I, I enjoyed him. And yet there's a way you could feel like just a little too flat for today's game at times. And can you sustain that? So maybe at least you see I, I, the Novak recovery part is interesting. So, okay. All right. You want to 12 ball rally me? Okay. Let's, let's, let's see what we, let's see what we got here. And, and maybe uh, does Novak then get in on him? Does Novak, I, that's going to be interesting. Clay is so much different now than it used to be because the ability to generate power with the strings and racket technology. Right. And I, I think in any time somebody is trying to do that against Djokovic on clay, the biggest factor becomes is Novak's forehand going to disrupt that in a way that makes it untenable. So it's like, okay, like, cool. You try to lengthen rallies, but you know, if the forehand is really on, like it has been at its peak on clay in recent years, you can't lengthen the rallies. Even if you try, you get pushed around and bullied and finished. So, um, and then, you know, he'll incorporate the drop shot. He volleyed extremely well today against Musetti. Uh, yes. Even if, now, even he, if got, he got passed a ton. He kept getting passed. But whenever he got a, his racket on it, perfect volley. I'm sure the new coach is getting all the credit. You know, doubles player, you know. Uh, Co- coaching, but, is, coaching is autobiography, right? Yeah. Yes. Coaching can be autobiography. Can be. Doesn't, it shouldn't. It's not supposed to be. But it often is, and then it gets interpreted. It can be interpreted as such. Right. The doubles guy is time to come in. On the other hand, it reminds me of like with Edberg and Federer. I said someone, I never heard a coach tell someone to come to net less. <laughs> Barely. Rarely have I heard a coach tell a player that. Only only if I were coaching coaching uh, Holger or Runa. Tell him to come to net less. He's, he's the only guy, only guy on tour I think comes forward too much. Interesting. Mm, that's a good idea for a story. Yeah, let's. I would. Look I'd love to. It. I'd love to read yeah. it. Let's. Let's do it, Amy. Okay. That'll do it for this episode of Three. Remember, we're available on all podcast platforms. We appreciate it if you like, comment, and subscribe. If you are watching on YouTube, and we will see you next time on the next episode of Three. <laughs>